time and I get her two weeks in a row. Uh, this is our, our Q&A session, um, just looking at different questions for uh, VA and hoping, hoping to see what we can do to help each other. So let's get into it. Uh, we've got a new setup today where we're getting to do both YouTube and Facebook. Uh, so the questions are going to come to us in a different format. Uh, so once we get the first question, we'll go ahead and start jumping in here. Um, Carol, while we're doing that, is oh, here we got the first question from Bobby. Once you receive your vocational letter from your expert for TDIU, how long do you how long do you review to make sure it hit all the right points? Or how do you, I'm sorry, how do you review to make sure it hit the right points? Well, I mean, I, I guess what the right points are with the vocational expert. Vocational expert is somebody who looks at your past jobs, the skills you had in those, education, and what they do is they figure out what jobs in your community you could do with that skill set. So what they do then is they look at the jobs in your area and they graft or overlay the problems you have to your disability. And they show due to your disability, we think, you know, here's the jobs you could do, but due to your disability, you'd have problems with this job or that job for these reasons. So, so what you're looking for is for them to actually be specific to you about what jobs you could do due to your past and then show you know, what those jobs require. Does it require for you to sit eight hours? Does it require for you to lift, you know, 50 pounds a day? And then, and then speak to why you would not be able to do that with your disability. So you, you want to put those together, the jobs, the requirements of the jobs, and then what problems your disability would cause with that. Radio Killer, we're back. Hey, before, oh. before we say, remember the key thing is all of those limitations have to be service, service connected, or service -connected <laughs> conditions. That's really important. Thanks, Carol. Um, all right, Rod M, I was 90% with TDIU and was recently increased to 100% P&T. Can I have the TDIU removed and only be permanent in total for, for 100%? If you are scheduled 100%, then yes, you can do that. Uh, let's see, Harry, 46382. Good to see you back. I'm 63 years old and have been 70% from 1999 and received 100% PTSD. Uh, for mental health issues about a year ago. What are the chances of the VA reevaluating me at my age? Well, if you are P&T, they should not reevaluate you. If you get back in the system, asking for an increase for something close to that, service connection for another mental health condition, they could reevaluate you. But if you stay out of the system, the chances of them coming after you, I would say are low. Matt, Caroline. how much did he say he was since 1999? Well, he, <clears throat> he was 70% since 99, so they can't touch that. That's the 20 year rules in effect there. But the 100% P&T is what he was asking about, I think. Right. Uh, another question on that just received, this is uh, Tyrone King, just received 100% P&T. Is that for life and can they take it away? I'm 61. They can take it away. Permanent total does not mean protected. That's something that, that VA gets on a lot of vets, okay? But what I was saying there is that permanent total means that they're admitting that your disability is static. So they should not be coming after you proactively. Yet if you put in for another disability or something close to the disabilities you already have, they could say, well, while we're reevaluating this, let's reevaluate what you already have. That's where you would get in trouble, but they should not come after you. Shouldn't come after you, but they can. Okay, Philip, uh, any updates on the legacy advance on the docket? I was approved waiting since June 2022. Uh, huh. Well, I'm glad you were approved. Um, oh, I guess you were probably approved for advance on the docket. That's a pretty long time to be waiting, I, I'd say, Carol, if you got an advance on the docket. Yeah, I definitely uh, um, send an email and find out what's going on with that. And then, Matt, you, they, we do have some updated information from the NOVA seminar about what's going on with these appeals. Um, remember the, v, the, BB, the VA told the BVA that they only wanted them to do legacy appeals. That's the old type of cases until they're done. Uh, and we found out at the NOVA seminar, there's still 200,000 legacy appeals pending. So that they're all in front of the AMA, which are the ones that were the new claims filed in about the last five years. So if you have an AMA claim, at the board, it's going to be sitting there unless you have a motion to advance, a reason for that. So 
that's bad news that we got, but we want to know where you are. And that's why now, instead of going to the board on AMA cases, we're trying to win whatever we can at the regional office, even though it's much harder there. And, so, and we're, yeah, I mean, as Carol said, we are going, <laughs> bending over backwards. We're going up for, you know, get initial decision, go to high level of view. They deny it. We go back for another with new evidence. And then, you know, hopefully, granted, if not, we go to higher level review. We just, we don't want to put our clients in that backlog. And again, the VA promised us three years yeah. ago when they created the system that it was going to be incredibly fast. You know, we'd have decisions for direct review from the board in under a year. And so, uh, you know, shame on us. We took them at their word. Yeah, um, so, we believe them. Yeah. So anyway, we're a little bitter with ourselves. <laughs> uh, all right, Mario. If my tinnitus claim was denied as service connected, what constitutes new evidence? My duty unit was never considered artillery due to not having an MOS. Um, I mean, you can have a statement from yourself saying I was in this specific unit uh, on these dates and, um, you know, this was a secondary duty if it wasn't your primary MOS and, and put that in there. If you have a buddy who was served with you in the artillery, I, that would be great. I'd put that in there. But the <clears throat> new evidence threshold, the new and rel relevant evidence is a low threshold. OK, so you could even say, please check this unit and see if I was in there and they would have to go do that. John Price, 2008, filed for hypertension, given a zero rating. I had blood pressure meds prescribed to me. I should have been rated 10%. Is this Q claim since it was obvious that I had hypertension meds prescribed in service? Oh. I mean, so for hypertension, the, the regs say they want three different ratings, right, Carol? Three, three different, different readings. readings. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I think that could be Q though. I mean, if they said he had it in service and they're prescribing medication, it doesn't matter if you're a zero percent. You should should have been uh, service connected for that. So, I would say that should be Q. Yeah, I mean, basically they're doubting. I think the his question though is, is it is he questioning the that he did get the rating or did he get the service connection? He was given a zero percent rating. <laughs> So he's questioning whether he can go back now and get 10%. Um, if you had meds that were prescribed to you on this and you were still using them after service, then yes, you should. If you stopped using them and your, and your blood pressure was within normal ranges, then, then no, you're not going to win that. So yeah. if you were still using it, then, then I'd say yes. Okay. Uh, let's see. Antoine Lewis or John, Jerry Tipton. Okay, injured my back and neck slipping. All right, Jerry, I don't know if we missed something further down, but uh, we'd need more information on that. Antoine Lewis, sorry. A higher level review for sleep apnea second to PTSD. I lost that. Uh, migraine, migraine second to tinnitus. Uh, low back condition and decision phase, fingers crossed. Let us know how that goes, Mr. Lewis. Mm -hmm. Fingers crossed here too, okay? Uh, tell... Tell Mr. Hill, thank you for the personal phone call to check in. Uh, I appreciate that very much. I'm assuming you mean my father, Mr. Hill, because I've never been called <laughs> Mr. Uh, KP, 100% uh, p and for bipolar. I love your channel. Great to hear that. Um, well, great to hear that you love our channel, but I'm hoping yeah. that means that we had a little bit to do with it, getting your the benefits you deserve. Trying to help my father, this is Jeremy, uh, get compensation for his diabetes type 2 that requires insulin. He thinks it was all the steroids he got that fried his pancreas. Is DM typically secondary uh, secondary to something else? It's its own it disease be. process for sure, but it can be. Yeah. Um, mental condition. Yeah. Mental. Yeah. Hypertension. There are a number of them. Just sleep apnea. Uh, but you're going to, uh, to boil that down, you're going to need a strong medical professional to say right. this could have caused it, um, excuse me, and then also give medical literature. I, 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 I mean, that, that's, a, that's a tough case. If you have a doctor supporting you, you could win that case. Don't expect it to win it the first go round. Okay. Right. You're, you're going to have to fight that up and down. And, and are there other ahead. possible causes for the pancreas and other problems? You know. The, yeah. Yeah. As Carol always says look broadly, you know, is there something yeah. else out there that, that could have caused this? 
Joseph Acosta, aloha. Hi there. I've been denied sleep apnea again, this time at higher level review. Should I ask for a board hearing now or apply for TDIU? What do we say to board hearings, Carol? You're going to sit there five years unless you're 75. Yeah. POW. Do not, yeah. yeah. Never ask for a board hearing when you're going up to the board. So you can oh, go the up board to the board. Hearing. Oh, I thought you meant yeah. the board. Yeah. No hearings. No. Never no. ask for a hearing. So you can go into the board. You can ask for a hearing. You ask for what's called the evidence lane, or you can ask for a direct review. Hearing we just discussed, you can put evidence in at a very specific point. Uh, the evidence lane, I believe you have 90 days to put evidence in. And then direct review is no new evidence. Um, okay, let's be clear on that because okay. it has been a trap from the VA. If you file the BVA evidence lane, it gives you 90 days, 90 days from when you file the appeal. They do not consider any evidence you put in between the time the appeal was denied and you file the claim, or it's very tricky. So as a safeguard, if you file a, a board appeal, asking for 90 days for evidence, put in all the evidence then, right after you file the At appeal. appeal yes. yeah. Ask after you file the appeal so that it will be considered. Otherwise, they won't even look at it. So what she's saying, and, and this, is, this is just breathtaking that the VA has done this, you get the denial, you make the appeal. This gap right here in between, if you put evidence in there in that gap, they won't look at it. However, you, you file the appeal and, and you know immediately put in the evidence or within that 90 days to look at it. So it, it, it makes no sense. Frankly, it's as veteran unfriendly as possible because you know, you're probably looking at four years. Um, so, all right, we got way afield of what you're saying. So I would not file for a board hearing. I would, uh, I would file the TDIU, it looks like you're saying, and I'd find a way to reopen the, the uh, through new and material, new and relevant evidence, the sleep apnea. I mean, as Carol said, we've been trying uh, just, just bending over backwards to keep those claims in the regional office because you actually get decisions somewhat timely. Whereas the board, and, and the for, board has literally thrown their hands up. Oh, say again? Yeah. Well, if the you're sleep is, apnea, make sure you file for every possibility, possible thing that could have caused the sleep apnea or contributed to it. Um, don't just file for service connected for sleep apnea if you have other disabilities that are service connected that may have caused them or contributed to them. So do some research on what causes sleep apnea and see if there are other ways that you can approach this. Yeah. TDIU, uh, if you're not working, file it. Yeah. Get them, get them both in the system. That's, right. that, I'd agree with that. Okay. Uh, Barbara, can you receive more than one SMC? Yes. Uh, Yes, but, or yes, and so the SMC you can receive multiple of is SMCK, and that's for loss of use of an organ. I think you can, I think we talked about this last week, you can see there's like seven or eight uh, SMCKs you can receive. You can receive that on top of any other compensation, meaning any other regular compensation or uh, service connected, or excuse me, SMC. Only where only place where that disappears if you were at the very top SMC R2, then they take that away. You cannot receive homebound and aid and attendance together. Basically, it's on a continuum. You know, you see receive homebound. If you show your worst, then you get aid and attendance. But you can't receive those together. It's just SMCK you can receive in addition to any of those. But then there are also others. Yeah, you can't receive multiple of the same SMC other than K, but there are others. There's L, there's M, there's P, right. there's O. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin Knowles, my neighbor was stationed at Randolph Air Force Base in Texas. He's suffering from cancer. He adamantly says, he says it is from the AFF and possible Agent Orange exposure. Uh, aircraft mechanic Vietnam era currently is 10% for tinnitus. Okay. So, the the fact that he was a mechanic so multiple angles here look on our website we have a uh we have a nationwide base um map that shows all all the bases across the u.s that had some kind of contaminant there if there was agent orange there it would be on there we've done a lot of research on this i just don't know it off the top of my head um so that's one avenue the because there's multiple carcinogenics that would probably be listed there the other is he was a mechanic uh, air, aircraft mechanic and we have won tons of cases on cancers on diabetes on different issues because the the, the chemicals they dealt with were, were awful carol right and that's that's the one that i would primarily push 
It was coming from the fuel that he had to smell, from the cleaning fluids that he used, and that's what caused the cancer. If you do research on Google, you're going to see that those things were awful. And that's the VA does grant those. They're going to fight the Air Force Base because they haven't approved it yet. But you're going to get a lot farther and faster from the aircraft mechanic problem. Yeah. Uh, James Wood, H&P told me I had a great chance for an appeal, but they are sending me to another law firm. Uh, why would this happen? Thanks. We, we get this question almost weekly, and, and I'll say this. Out of the cases we see, we probably accept 4%. And that's for a range of reasons. But if we see a case we consider to be good, um, we either try to take it or, or we send it out. And the main reason we send out cases is because we can only handle so many internally. Um, you know, it's important for us to not be a mill. We want to be something to where we handle cases that we know we can give the, the veterans the individual attention they deserve. And so when we see cases that, you know, there are cases we just flat out turn down. But there are other cases we say, look, we can't handle this right now, but we have gone out and frankly made solid connections with other firms that we know personally and we know will do a good job. And when I'm saying connections, this has been forged over 10, 20 years. So um, we feel good about that. So, you know, the fact that we can't take your case, you know, we used to just turn people down flat and just say, hey, look, we, we can't do it because either it's not a case we think we can win or we just don't have the capacity. Um, you know, now we try to make sure those cases that are good get into hands where, where people can win. Yeah. And it, I, I want to say that when we take a case, I want to know that I've done the best job I possibly can on that case. And therefore, I'm limited on how many cases I can actually take. And before we would just tell people, I'm sorry, we think you have a good case. Please find someone else. And they ended up either not getting anybody or sometimes they found people who really didn't know what they were doing. So now there <laughs> we have. Over the years, we've done this for, I've done it 30 years, and we know that these people we are sending you to are good. So if we can't take it, we want to let you know somebody that we think is good enough to really do a good job on your case. I wish we could take them all, but I'm only going to take them and know I can really do a good job on them. Yeah. Explore AZ. Do I need to continue care with the VA to show that I'm not getting better? Uh, or can I use my personal doctors? I hate going to the VA if I can help it. Don't go to the VA if you don't want to. If you have personal doctors, that is great. Um, you know, maybe you get uh, your medication or whatever else you need from the VA free. You need to get notes, okay? You need to get, you need to have updated notes. I think you need to go to the VA once a year to a general physician just so you're in the system. I, I know you might not want to do that, but I would do that just to make sure you're in there and then you can get all the free medication and everything else. But if you have your own doctor, I'm, I'm with you. I would, I would do that. I'd also um, say regardless of the doctor you have, whether it's private or VA, read the notes. If yeah. the notes are saying you're fine, doing better, you know, is that what you're really telling them? So please read the notes. Yeah. Um, Parsons Bradley. My PTSD claim came back as unspecified anxiety. I had planned to file my sleep apnea secondary to PTSD. Does the change to unspecified anxiety cut that off? No. PTSD is a form of anxiety, so it doesn't. Now, it's still going to be hard. <clears throat> They're still going to deny you because they hate that. Uh, they hate when they have to make sleep apnea secondary to a mental health condition. Um, my two cents on the 30% rating, if this is your initial grant, and they gave you 30%. That's great that they gave you service connection, but I would want to know, is that the worst or is that the, is that the highest level you get? So by that, I'd mean, are you self-isolating? Can you not do well in crowds? Are you having trouble with friends or even family members? Um, you know, do you do ritualistic behaviors that just basically interfere with everyday life? You know, checking the locks every night, even though you're tired, you just keep on roaming the perimeter. Uh, so just, just make sure that could be where if you will, the low hanging fruit is to get you the higher rating. I would, I would just look at that because when VA finally grants service connection, their next best trip is they lowball the actual rating. So you really want to get the DBQ, the disability benefits questionnaire <clears throat> from the VA. You can just go online, Google it and see what are the, they will show you the criteria for each one of the problems that you have. So if you have suicidal thoughts, if you something you think about, I wish I weren't here Maybe it's best if I weren't here. It doesn't mean that you're going to go out and do that. or, But if you have those thoughts, that's a 70% rating right there. Yeah. 
Okay, K-9 companion, how long must you be unemployed before filing for unemployability? Had to quit my job last July, but already made too much for 2002. Denied unemployability last month. Okay, had to quit last July, so, so this year. Um, it doesn't matter how much you've made to date yeah. this year. The day you quit is the day you were unable to work. Yeah. And that's what you and should so, have led. And, 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 and yeah, and so you appeal that. Um, all right, Andrea Gibson got got uh, rated at 70% a year ago and then 100% last month. I would like to go for back benefits for last year. Would I be taking a chance on losing my 100%? I, I mean, you're always taking a chance, right? The VA does what the VA does. But if it's on a direct appeal, which this would be, meaning you have a live claim that it still has, has a year till appeal, I would definitely do that. Because a lot of times what they do is they, I see this so often. Yeah. When you, when you file a supplemental claim to a denial, instead of going all the way back, they just file at the date of that or the date of 8940. I would take this to a higher level review. Uh, let's see. What's that? Okay. LG, can I claim degenerative changes in my ankles? I've been service connected since 01 and currently in the IDES medical retirement process. Thank you. I, mean, I, I, I found a lot, if you did a lot of marching, I, I found that we're really winning those even at the re regional office because of the boots. If you had those boots that had no support, uh, and you can show that you had to do a lot of running, physical therapy, things like physical activity, I think you have a good chance of that. I, I've won several of those on the initial claim. So go for it. Uh, and, and you have nothing to lose on that, by the way, right. since you've been over 20 years. So it's not like they can try to take away what you already have. Uh, all right, Albert, BJ Dean, I have TBI seizures and currently at 90%. I have a claim submitted. Any way to expedite this? Right now, not employed and struggling. If you can quantify struggling, meaning like if you can show electric bills overdue, a mortgage payment overdue, a foreclosure coming soon, or let's say like a landlord saying they're going to, you know, evict you, then you could do that. But they need to see evidence. They, you know, it's the VA. They're veteran friendly, but they don't trust vets. So you <laughs> yeah, got to actually, you, you actually got to show something in there. So, and I hope that you're applying for both an increased rating in your underlying symptoms and TDIU, because if you're not working due to that, you know, one way or the other, you should win. Thinking thing, veteran is rated 100%. Veteran recently got Social Security on recon. On disability determination explanation, the DDS psychologist incorrectly stated that depression started in high school. Uh, it did not, and there are no indicators of, in any medical records. If VA sees this report, is veteran at risk of having this 100% mental They're health? They're not likely to see it. If you've already got 100%, they're not going to, they're not going to look at that. Yeah, I, I don't, I agree with that. Yeah, um, I wouldn't but, really yeah. Ray Atkinson, good to see you, Ray. My documents in H&P's hands was told by VA could not rate because of the pain, laugh out loud. If I move, it hurts. Guess chronic pain is not a thing. Hopefully H&P can school them. It is a thing, Ray, uh, but this is one of those things when you trickle down, you know, it's like it, it, this has been, uh, this was a big decision that came out two years ago that chronic pain is a disability in of itself. Uh, but the, you know, the Board of Veterans Appeals kind of knows that. But unfortunately, uh, the regional office, that they don't really follow uh, case law. So that, that's a problem. All right. Uh, let's see. Marvin, hello. I got a CMP exam this Monday for thyroid and hypertension issues. Since the VA has my records from my private doc, why would they need this exam since I'm already diagnosed? Well, they need this exam to deny you. Um, <laughs> you know, the CMP exam is supposed to help you prove your case. If you have a fully developed case, they shouldn't send it to you. What they could be saying is, well, we need to look and see what happened in service and make sure it's related and get what's called a nexus to show them together. But a lot of times what happens for us is we get vets come to us who've already got all that together. They've got the you know, current disability injury in service and they got a doctor putting them together and the VA still sends them CMP exam, exams. And you know, the real kicker is if you don't go, they have an automatic denial. So right. you, you, know, you gotta play their game. That's what it comes down to. Michael Goins, good to see you again. My cancer claim filed in January, 2020 for lymphoma and residuals 
is in hyperdrive. Two CMP exams in 30 days. Will this be completed soon? Eight conditions evaluated at last CMP, all favorable from MD. I would hope so. I mean, the fact that, that they're, it sounds like they're telling you it's favorable, that's wonderful news. As far as, you know, will this hyperdrive continue through you getting decision? I don't know. Uh, with multiple issues like that, sometimes the rater will send it back just to make sure things are right. But, you know, they have everything they need to, to rate this now. So hopefully you'll see this decision within, I, I don't know, a month. <laughs> Uh, don't hold me to that though. Yeah. Um, all right, Bobby, have you heard about water issues at Fort Hurt, uh, Fort Ert, uh, Ord, Ord. Ord in California? And the government has knowledge that water was contaminated and soldiers are claiming high rate of cancer. I have heard about this. Again, look at our toxic map um, and to pull it up and you can see the specific toxins that were there. And then once you see the toxins, you can show it also shows what kind of disabilities or cancers they cause. So this would be one where you'd have to fight tooth and nail because the VA is not going to want to admit it because it's not on any list of theirs. But I leave, I believe Fort Ord was either made a Superfund site or it was supposed to be one and the DOD blocked it for political or political reasons. So I, I have heard and, and you definitely want to keep on fighting on that. Todd, I was in my dis file on my health benefit my healthy vet and notice that it says we finished reviewing your claim and will a decision will be made 1026 i didn't do i didn't do a claim any ideas where they're saying this i, I think somebody pushed a button i mean you don't want to overthink this as the va uh you know who knows um uh, yeah I, I don't have a good answer for you kate p is thyroid cancer covered under the pact act for oif vets Oh, Carol, what do you think on that? No. I think it's Can't respiratory. It's, it's it's respiratory. I think it's respiratory cancer, which yeah. in my understanding includes thyroid, but they haven't let that play out yet. So right. I think you should win that, whether you win it through a presumptive case, I'm not sure. Yeah, until Mario, the VA really oh. issues regulations on this, we're not sure what they're going to do. That's yeah. the problem. So that's in this, you know, there's a statute that the that Congress and the president passed, but then the agency of the VA has to get a lot more detailed. So until we see that, we don't know for certain. And they're not even going to, that's not even supposed to come out until January. So who knows when will it come out? <clears throat> Joanne, I recently had a VA decision for a remand that said they weren't able to fully decide my claim and was going to send it back to the board. Is that a good or bad thing? Uh, it's for general anxiety. Okay, so... <clears throat> You had a decision for remand. So what I'm going to read here is that the board remanded it, and this is from what you're saying in the legacy system, and then the uh, regional office issues what's called a supplemental statement of the claim, and they, they denied it again, but then they said it's going back to the board automatically. Uh, if that's the case, 90% of cases remanded from the board get sent back up, so I would not read into that too much. Yeah, the problem is I worry about what additional evidence did they get? And if it's not favorable, mm. that may not help you. So if you, yeah, if they got a CMP exam or something. Exam, did they send somebody out for just an opinion? You need to figure out what happened. And if it's not favorable, maybe you want to put, a, maybe you want to file a motion for continuance while you get additional evidence. Yeah, or, or yeah, exactly. Or get their evidence, start there. What did they do? I'd start did there and see if it's favorable, yeah. right. If it were favorable though, they would have granted it. So, so I have a strong feeling it's not favorable. So you definitely need to file a motion for continuance, um, get some evidence. You may get somebody, you may need somebody to help you because this is your, this is probably the last shot. They're probably not going to remand it again. And once the board makes a decision, it's really hard because you have to go to the CABC. You want to get this one right. Katie Knowles, 40. I'm helping my neighbor. He's a Vietnam vet from 72 to 76, suffers from diabetes, hypertension, colon, renal cancer, vertigo, and insomnia. He had prolonged exposure to JP4 and AFF and PFAS. So Vietnam era vet, I'm assuming he was not in the Vietnam theater, uh, but as far as all those disabilities you listed and he was exposed to JP4, that was something we were talking about earlier with a, with a airplane mechanic, aircraft mechanic. That is a really awful toxin, uh, that fuel. So that's what I'd be looking to try to develop these disabilities on. And so 
what you want to do here is if all those are not related to JP4, meaning that the medical science says, you know, they're not all connected, if you can find an umbrella like the diabetes, if you can connect that and or the hypertension even and show that those um, kind of cause the other ones, that's what you want to do. You're going to need an outside doc for this one, though, because that's You're going to uh, need a good doctor that can give you yeah. a good opinion. Yeah. KLS Avenue 2. I'm 10% for tinnitus, 40 for back, awaiting mental health decision. New M EMG shows radiculopathy from back, but MD won't write a nexus. Should I just file a claim, intent to file? When should I file TDIU? I would file all those together. Um, if you're, you know, your service connected for your back already, um, I would go ahead and file the, the radiculopathy. If you think it's uh, causing unemployability, I'd file that all, just get it all in there and get it in the system. Steve the Asian, I was told that despite my intent to file in 2019, that by fighting the VA for so long and filing supplemental claims 60 days ago, that I'd only have back pay, uh, back pay to supplemental submission. Is that true? No. This is this is the nonsense they are rolling out now that is really, really frustrating. And frankly, it's clogging up the system. So if that's what they tell you and that's what they put in the decision, you got to appeal. And it's such a basic appeal. All your appeal is just, hey, this is the first one I filed. This was the decision. This is the last supplemental claim. And you just show that all of those happen, you know, in a continuum and they should grant you back. That's how the VA sold us on this new AMA program. They said your claim will, if you continue to appeal it, the onset date will remain the same. You won't lose that. That was a great selling point. And they don't do that. They they will give you the date of the last thing you filed. So you have to appeal that. Tom Darko, uh, let's see, 10% rating since 2012. I've been receiving a pension since 2012 uh, and receiving SSDI since 14. Got a letter saying this month that the, that the VA, they are taking my pension because of the social security disability. Those are direct offsets. So if you, you know, you get the higher one, uh, and so they can come in and take that. So just, you know, that, that, that is what it is. Um, let's see. Marvelous Williams. Uh, are VSOs credible? Carol? No, you're not lopping that to me. You know what I think. I think they're VSOs. There's some who really care, but I think they don't have any training. They really don't know what they're doing. They may know how to file a claim. But they don't know the law. I mean, I don't even know what training they get, but it's very limited. And that's sad because veterans entrust their case to them and they don't realize that they really don't know. So I, they're nice people. I think they're honorable. I think they have good intentions. But it was, would you like somebody who's got six weeks of training to operate on you? I mean, they just don't know what they're doing. I have a lot of VSOs who have come to me to handle the case. Yeah, I, I would also say that they are overworked. You know, they, they yes. have too many cases. They get so many cases and they can't really dig into the files. They can't get medical exams. So that, you know, they're, they're practicing with an with arm tied behind their back. So that, you know, makes it really difficult. And so that means they react. You want to file a claim? I'll file a claim for you. I got somebody else behind you. I got to file a claim for him. So they don't really have time to figure out what your claim is and how to advise you and how to really help you. Uh, Kelly, I have TDIU. Can I still ride a motorcycle? Uh, nothing <laughs> against that. <laughs> um, Hobie, can you discuss requirements slash process for SSDI? Currently retired from active duty, uh, receiving 100% PNC. Yeah, the the thing that's different about Social Security disability is that it was made for people who are currently working. So the Social Security Administration, every year you work, they give you so many credits. So each year you can get four credits. So out of 10 years, you could get 40 credits, okay? They say you have to have 20 credits. You have to work five out of the last 10 years and paid Social Security taxes on that money to be insured. So like with, with um, the VA, you have to show a service connection 
with the Social Security disability, you have to show you worked and paid Social Security in five out of the last 10 years. And that's called your date last insured. And you'll be able to, first of all, you should get a copy of your Social Security's earnings record and make sure that they have reported all your earnings and payment. And then it will give you date last insured. And you have to prove that you became disabled before that date. Okay, Jim, I am 60% right now waiting on a claim that was sent back for a remand for 50%. What will my final disabilities be uh, when, with their calculation? Oh, come on, Jim. This is why we have that darn VA calculator on our website. I, we're attorneys. We don't do math. So the easy question would be if you had a 60%, one rating at 60%, then you take the other 40%, that, that you're healthy and you take 50% of that. So that would be 20. So you'd be 80%. But if you have multiple disabilities adding up to 60%, that's a whole nother ball game because you could be 64% and at 60, or you could be 56% and at 60. So it just depends. Um, look at our calculator that puts it all out there. Don't ever trust the lawyer when it comes to math. <laughs> Kevin Trotter, 90% disabled, static disability, eye disease. I also receive SMCK for loss of one eye. Should I file for TDIU? If you're not working and that's one of the main reasons you're not working, yes, definitely. Uh, Remy86, good to see you again. I have multiple service-connected diagnosis, MDD, MTSS, migraines, peripheral neuropathy. How would I file secondary to sleep apnea? This is, this is where you throw the kitchen sink at them. You say, I have sleep apnea. If you think it's related to directly to service, say why. But if you think it's related to these, say, I have all these other disabilities. And once I had them all, you know, I started having sleep apnea. Let them figure it out. Let them send you to CMP exam to show what could have caused it. C4, once the case is appealed, how long is the process once expedited for next uh, to near homelessness? should be quick. I mean, and it should be something if it's not quick, you are calling uh, the VA, you know, hopefully day in, day out saying I need these benefits now. They can do these things in a day. I have still yeah. seen them, you know, take way too long. So be pushing them. Okay. This is you a, need to find out what is it they're waiting for to make their decision. Yeah. And also the VA now has a homelessness coordinator. Some are better than others. Some are, are will will prompt the VA to make a decision. So if you have a homeless coordinator, ask for their help. Yeah. Uh, Johnny White, will you update the podcast anytime soon? Last ones I have are from September uh, on the podcast app. So just to let you know, we had a turnover. Uh, Efrain, our longtime, um, our longtime video guy and podcast guy left. And so we were just bringing on Nate, our, our new uh, video tech. And so it's going to, be a while, but yes, long answer short, we hope to get those updated sometime soon. Thanks for listening, Johnny. Rachel, hi, thank you for doing this. Do you know the current turnaround time for supplemental claims for Vietnam vets considering the PACT Act recently being passed? Uh, there is no real difference in the turnaround mm -hmm. time unless, as Carol would say, you're at the board and you're over 75 or you're at um, the regional office and you're over 85. That's the real. Well, this is for supplemental claims. And I don't, I, mean, I don't think, oh, like, but not, like you say, Matt, there's no difference for Vietnam vets than there is for um, other people. Remember at the board, if you're 75 or older, they will advance your case on the docket. But at the regional office, who really loves veterans, you have to be 85. So they're only going to um, act faster on that if you're 85, homeless, POW, Purple Heart winner. Look at the list that we've published a bunch of times and see if you fit into any of those. Okay, Manuel Rodriguez, 100% PNT. One, uh, oh man, I missed this. Okay, 100% PNT. One of my disabilities is for monovision. Within the last three years, I've had serious issues with my better eye and almost total mm -hmm. peripheral vision loss. There is a special. Um, uh, should I apply for increase now that I am legally blind? So there is a special mm -hmm. regulation that very few people look at and understand, and it's called the I'm going to mess that up. What's the name of paired organs, Carol? Yes. Paired. Yeah. So if you have, you know, you have an eye disability that's service connected in one eye, and then all of a sudden your other eye goes bad, then, then you can, then they just admit that it's related to service. So uh, coming back to what you're saying, you need to file for that second eye. 
Um, you, you, I was going to say you're 100%. Uh, if you have blindness, legal blindness is not the same qualification the VA looks at for loss of use of vision, but you need to file for that as well because if you get that, you can get a special monthly comp that's pretty high. So, and you should uh, be filing for aid and attendance as well because I'm sure you need activities of daily living helped. There are a lot that you can't do. Yeah. Uh, Reek, oh my. When does reasonable doubt apply after a CMP exam? Uh, anywhere between <laughs> never and once in a while, once yeah. in a blue moon. <laughs> I, yeah. Again, we deal with cases that are denied. Things, yeah. <laughs> so you have 55 things helping you and one thing against you, that's reasonable doubt for the VA. It is. It's yeah. ridiculous. I, I, would, I, I think our official answer is I would not count on that. Yeah. Uh, Joshua, I heard that 100% PNT can be reduced. Is that right? Yes, it can be. It is not a protected rating. Okay. If you're permanent total, that means VA sees your disabilities as static. So if you're not in the system, the likelihood of you being reduced is a lot less. By uh, in the system, Matt, you mean <laughs> normally when a veteran has a high rating, the VA schedules a follow up CMP exam. Okay. If they've considered you static, you're not going to get better or permanent in total, then they don't schedule that. So that's what he means about you're not in the system. You're not on the radar. She's my translator. Uh, Joseph, I continue to gather information. I mean, info on everything. Then I look at all that I've gathered and don't know where to start on filing. 60% now and my brain is stuck. Part of my MM, MDD, et cetera, ma'am. Uh, file it. Go to um, go to a BSO, you know, get them to put it in for you. If you've got information, I mean, again, VA has a duty to assist you. If you go in and you say, hey, this should be higher or, hey, I think this is secondary to my uh, depression or this is related to service, they have, a, they have a duty to go out and get records, okay? You might have to say, here's where I treat um, and, and here's how long it's been going on, but, but they need to help you do that. But remember, if you just file things, unless they're, they recently denied you within the last year or there's a pending appeal, they're not going to do anything with it. So what, what's your status? Were you denied within the last year? Do you have a pending a claim? So make sure you do that along with uh, submitting this additional evidence. Yeah. Proverbs House. Uh, my father is considered a Vietnam Blue Water veteran who never filed a claim but passed away from cancer in 2015. Can my mother or myself file a claim for any benefits? Well, ooh, this is a tricky yeah. one. Your, your mother can file for, for an ongoing widow's claim, a DIC. Yeah. I don't think you can get past due benefits uh, for him if you never filed, though. Right. But the mother definitely is entitled to yeah. DIC benefits. Um, all right. We have to cut this a little short today. Uh, but so let's go for another five or six minutes here. Monica, um, VBA 2010-207, A-R-E form, if approved, provides priority uh, processing to veterans who are very seriously injured or seriously injured during military thank operations. Thank you for telling me about that. I keep forgetting that. And I'm going to put that on my list. Thank you. Thank you. And that's why it's so great when you all help us so that we can help other people as well. Uh, her question goes on. Via additive math, I have individual ratings totaling 580%, my God, of which 100% is PTSD rating coming from Afghanistan. Would, should the VA consider me very serious or seriously injured uh, and grant me priority processing based on my ratings? If not, what percentage rating equals very seriously or seriously injured? Um, Again, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know that as far as what um, ratings. But I, I guess my question to you would be, what are you looking to get an increase for? If you're 100 percent for PTSD, you have other ratings that are 580. You should be getting SMCS. Okay, um, it, it, that that should have just been automatic because you're already 100 percent for just one rating. So I, you know, if you need aid and attendance, maybe uh, then then that's what I'd be filing for. But I, I don't, I don't have the answer to that, Carol. Do you? Well, seriously injured to me means you've lost extremities, you can't use extremities, you may be blind or deaf or some very serious injury. And, and I guess I don't know enough to know where you are, but it seems to me you should remember 
an individual can get at 100% around 3,300, maybe going up to 3,500, but some individuals get $10,000 a month under that SMC program. And I wonder if you if you meet a number of those SMC um, disabilities and just this blanket together, I can't tell them. That makes me really sad and nervous for you. Um, if I had more information, I could I could give you a better answer. But it makes me realize, think that you probably are, are entitled to a much higher rating under SMC. William Murray, 30% PTSD service connected, have sleep apnea, hypertension, fibromyalgia, allergic sinusitis, uh, neuropathy in arm, broken ankle, uh, not claimed yet. What would be the best order for secondary? I would file all this and let the VA figure it out, okay? I mean, sleep apnea, hypertension can both, uh, I consider them obvious secondary to PTSD. Um, neuropathy in the arms, I don't, I don't know what else you might be service connected before, that's a little more difficult. Um, but if you think they're related to service or, I, I don't think all those are related to PTSD, I'll, I'll tell you that. Fibromyalgia is, is one that could be as well, but with the other issues, um, I, I would file them all if you think they're related to service, but I don't, you know, I don't know how you would, I don't know, Carol, what, what do you think? Well, first of all, why have you not fallen for the broken ankle? That That's something I see from veterans and I don't understand it. I don't know who's telling you file one thing, then file the other. That is such bad information because the VA is not going to pay you until the month after you filed. So please, if you have claims, file them all. It really does not affect I've seen lots of claims where they had granted one and didn't grant others, but by not filing, you're really hurting yourself. I'm with Matt on with uh, PTSD. I would I would use all of these. I'd file all of them and have all of them as possible causes of sleep nap, apnea or any of the others that you have. Um, you really have to file them and see where the VA goes, and then then you can react to that. That's probably your best advice, but file them all. Yeah. Stephanie Hicks, I filed HLRs on disability and VRE claims to, uh, for Qs. So many errors were made. Claims are now with Office of Administrative Review due to the errors and hardship. Have you ever had any dealings with this OFC? Um, I don't know what OFC is, but I have had dealings with the o Office of Administrative Review. If yeah. you, we've, we've asked them to review some, and every once in a while they review it. If, that, uh, if they pulled it themselves, uh, they are seeing the serious nature of, of the grievous uh, mistake. So I'd call that a good thing overall. But, then, but remember, they're not fast. No. They're just like the VA. You never know when they're actually going to do something because a lot of times – Somebody will make a decision and it needs to be looked over. It is looked over by somebody else, which really causes delay. Okay. Uh, CAT 6 criterion. VA just had me meet with two therapists at the same time for my PTSD, and they were asking me questions on my condition is current for the past 30 days. Are they looking to lower my rating? Well, if you didn't ask for an increase, then yes, they're looking to see if you are still rated, if you should still be rated the same. Uh, you know, we deal a lot with these where a vet comes to us and they've already been reduced. Like there's this, they do this thing where they propose a reduction and they'll let you put evidence in. We don't really handle those cases, but if a veteran has been reduced, we'll take those cases. And a lot of times we find that not only should they not have been reduced, they should have actually been increased. So, you know, if they, if they propose to reduce you fight, you know, if, if you think it's still the same or even worse, and as Carol would say, go get a copy of the disability benefit questionnaire. Um, I think, uh, Nate, if you could throw that up there, maybe I could throw that up there. That would be great. But, but you look for that and, and see what are your worst disabilities. And you also have a copy of what these therapists said. You need that to fight it. Yeah. You know, the first step is the therapist said this, I, that I said this, I definitely did not say that. I don't, you know, this, this, this report is totally inaccurate and point out why it's inaccurate. That's your first step. And then if you're seeing a therapist yourself, get a report from them. But you definitely fight this. Okay, we got time for just a couple more questions here. Uh, Jay B uh, Breakfield, um, hey guys, I'm 100% uh, p and and have a VA caregiver because of the neuropathy in my hands and feet. Uh, two ADLs I need help with. Is aid and attendance the same as my caregiver program? No. no. 
Veterans Benefit Administration, that's what we're talking about here. Getting service connected disability, getting SMC, which is a which is the aid in attendance. Veterans Health Administration administers the ca caregiver. Okay, so I look at your case. The fact that they're giving you a caregiver, to me, you should be getting uh, aid in attendance. But in addition to that, you're getting caregiver for neuropathy in your hands and your feet. That tells me you have a potential claim for loss of use of hands and loss of use of feet. You know, we've talked about this before, but loss of use of hands is loss of use of, of fine motor skills. You can't button your buttons. You can't tie your shoes. You have to make major modifications to use utensils to eat. That is a serious SMC rating, okay? SMCL is where you'd be for aid and attendance. Uh, Carol, I don't know off the top of my head, but it'd probably be SMCN or even O. It would be O actually for, um, for, for this, which takes you from like, you know, close to $4,000 a month all the way up to probably six or $7,000 a month. So uh, you need to get claims in there for those. And they might fight you, but if, if that's why you're getting the caregiver, that to me says you have, unfortunately, some significant problems with, with your feet and hands. These are serious cases. So these are ones that we look at because the VA is going to fight you tooth and nail. They do yeah. not like giving us money out. Um, all right, a couple, I, I just have one more question and maybe maybe uh, a comment here. Kelly, H&P didn't take my case, referred me to an excellent attorney, Greg Rady, Greg Rada, who filed my appeal and won my case in just two weeks, helping me get 100% for a uh, rating for me. Again, we can't take all cases, but what we try to do is, is find great folks that help. And I, uh, I think right. Greg's one of the best. Okay, uh, let's see here. Um, so last question here from Roddy Jones. Can I claim TBI for a car accident caused by one of my symptoms I've diagnosed with? Got a ticket for careless and reckless driving. Carol? Mm. Yeah, I think he can. It, Let's say he had PTSD and, and you know, he got road rage. Some, some idiot, you know, cut him off. Uh, and then all of a sudden he's going 90 miles an hour and hits a telephone pole or something. Yeah, that's, so that, to me, that's a secondary service connection. But that that depends, because if it's not in the line of duty, what happened, then they're going to deny you. So you need well, to be able to show. No, he's talking. Well, OK, my understanding of this is he, he's it saying this happened post-service. He got a ticket for careless and reckless, reckless. Oh, is this after service? Yeah, that's my understanding. It was a symptom of a service-connected disability. And then after service, he had this um, this problem. Yeah, if it's caused by a, mil yeah. a service connected problem, yes. If it's in yeah. the service, you need to see whether it was line of duty and if you can fight that by saying it was caused by a service connected problem. Uh, well, I know there are tons more questions. Today, we, uh, we, we got a hard stop here uh, and, and can't take any more right now. Um, but we appreciate y'all coming here. I, I got to say, you I do. love it every time I see that uh, we've got folks who come to us and say, hey, we've won this, uh, might have been listening to us for a while and got just a little nugget from us to help them along the way. It's just great to hear that. And as Carol said, there's stuff we don't know. And you guys yeah. pointed out to us, helps helps our vets too, and it helps everybody else watching here. So thank you all so much. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing you. Uh, we'll hope to see you on, on, on Thanksgiving week. It might be a little bit earlier, uh, but but we'll go from there. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks. Bye.